Pamela Denise Long, thanks for joining us on the Illinois channel, and uh, we're going to be talking to you uh, about a variety of issues, but what brought you to our attention, uh, and we wanted to share with the audience, is uh, an article that you wrote as a contributor to Newsweek magazine, and you were writing about the relationship of black voters and black America to the Democratic Party, and part of that article, you mentioned that in black America, there's a growing contempt for an influential far left that talks a woke game on diversity and appropriates our struggles in their ads and talking point, yet offers our communities little beyond the feeling of inclusion. So uh, with that as a framework for the purposes of our audience to know what you were talking about, why don't we have you expand a little bit upon what you were saying in that article and your general thoughts about whether or not black America needs to divorce itself from the Democratic Party? Yeah, Terry, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here to have this conversation with you. So what we do know is that the black America, black American voters have been the base and a consistent ally to the Democrat party for quite some time, uh, the Democratic party for quite some time. And what we do know is though Biden in his uh, celebratory speech uh, promised black America that he would have our back because we've always had his what we see is that the Biden-Harris administration has not provided specific benefits to Black America, specific redress to the longstanding, uh, seemingly intractable needs and concerns of Black America. We talk about voting rights, as well as the other initiatives that uh, the Democratic Party and the current legislature have provided to other groups specifically uh, in their names, but have not provided to Black America, who we know is the base for the Democratic Party. And what I'm suggesting is that's not acceptable and that we have to hold the Democratic Party to account now as well as in the future going forward and explore all of our options so that the needs of Black America I think I'm roughly right that 90% or so of black America votes with the Democratic Party in elections. And they're so therefore, because they're such a major voting block within the Democratic Party, they're a key part of that, uh, the Democrats winning an election, whether at the national level or the local level. Uh, certainly we see that uh, in urban areas where so many cities are uh, controlled by Democratic parties, as is Chicago. Um, and, and frankly, most, uh, probably most American big cities uh, are controlled by Democrats, in part, in a large part, with the vote of black America. Uh, would you, are you suggesting that it's time for uh, black voters to take a new look at the Republican Party or just kind of what, what do you suggest is uh, the change that should be coming about? Yeah, so I will say that you are right that a large percentage of Black America tends to vote Democratic. What we did see, though, is that uh, in President Trump's re-election, he was able to garner double digits of Black support, particularly among Black men, and also an increasing percentage of Black female voters voted for President Trump over President Biden. And why is that? President Trump spoke specifically to Black Americans' uh, needs. He welcomed Black Americans who supported the America's First, Americans First platform. And what I am suggesting is it is past time for Black American voters to consider all of our options when it comes to getting our political needs met. Because what we do know is the cities that you mentioned, right, have been democratically run, run by the Democratic Party, have been voted into office by Black Americans, and have been underserved. The needs of Black Americans have been underserved in those areas. What we do know is that everyone wants our cities and the residents within them to have what they need uh, to address poverty, to address education, to address incarceration and the dynamics that lead to it so that we all benefit from a healthy America. The needs of Black America are directly tied into the quality of life 
of all Americans. And I don't think that's been adequately framed. So I think we should consider all options. Black Americans should be at all tables, should be in all spheres of influence, and should consider the parties that are best aligned with our needs, but we have to communicate those needs. And thus far, we haven't been doing that as consistently, as broadly, and as diversely as we should. Let me throw out a, off the top of my head a little theory here, and you tell me if I'm on target or off target. You're a very professional person highly educated, working on your PhD. Uh, I would say as we look around, when I look back from when I was growing up in the 60s, I think there's a larger professional component of black America, more, you know, more professionalism, higher educated than say, if we look back in previous decades of the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So uh, to what extent is this a natural progression that maybe black Americans should be looking as they become more affluent, as they be, be become in larger numbers part of the middle class, that they would look to the Republican Party as addressing some of the issues that they're concerned about, property taxes on homes, just taxes in general. Um, and, and it seems as if what we often hear from the Democratic Party as if they still talk to black America um, on issues as if they are all downtrodden and uh, are looking for, you know, handouts and we're going to give you food stamps and the rest. Is, is that part of this or am I off target? Yeah, I think what I hear you saying is that with the upward mobility of Black America and Republicans tending to implement policies that focus on economics and lower taxes and the like, that the more wealth that Black Americans accumulate, the more they are likely to uh, adhere to or adapt the idea that all Americans do, which is they want to safeguard their income and their wealth for themselves and their progeny. That That is part of it. I will say though that Black Americans uh, historically um, have voted Republican. Obviously the party of Lincoln uh, and radical Republicans were the party that enabled the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments that were really about enslaved people and, and, and their descendants uh, and the rest of the Americans or people who immigrate to America who, who benefit from those policies. Uh, and what we saw is there was uh, two waves of voting shifts among black Americans. One, when black people uh, or slaves were emancipated, uh, they went through all the economic uh, issues that they experienced, including the Great Depression, where they were excluded based upon race, right? And then in the 60s, what you saw is that Black Americans switched to the Democratic Party again because of social programs that supported that economic base. So with both of the switches that you see to uh, from Repubs to Dems, it was really about economics. And what I often say that Democrats get wrong is to your point, they frame racial equity as an emotional issue when what it really is, is an economic issue. Slavery, which they speak to often in their talking points, as well as Jim Crow and segregation was a social issue, but ultimately it affected the economic resources and the base of Black American families and Black American communities. So yes, as Black America, uh, realizes and recognizes and pushes against the idea that equity for us is not emotional, it's economic. We are looking to parties and political stakeholders at all levels, national, state, local, who are offering and undergirding and providing policies that support our economic prosperity because ultimately that is what we need, not emotionality. If, if you were talking to uh, the the head of the Republican Party or the RNC or uh, Speaker Mac or McCarthy, uh, Representative McCarthy, who people expect to be the next speaker uh, after the November election. What w and they said, uh, Denise, tell us what message should we be championing if we want to increase black voters' participation in the Republican Party? What would you tell them? Well, one, I would tell them to really recognize the reasons that Black voters have not remained with the Republican Party over this time. 
part of it I call out in the article, which is that some in the Republican Party seem to embrace policies that appear to be racist in action, right? So we look at the ways in which uh, traditionally it has been conservative and Republican uh, stakeholders who are leading redistricting that seems to limit and affect predominantly Black voters. Now, we can have a conversation about why that is happening, but the reality is that they seem to be making it difficult, uh, according to uh, thought leaders, for Black folk, particularly, uh, to vote in predominantly Black districts. And when it's not a predominantly Black district, but it's a heavy Democratic district, Black folks are disproportionately affected according to their percentage of the population in the United States, right? So what I would say is recognize that reality and address it. One of those things we need to do is really be specific and speak to Black American needs, uh, name Black Americans. We need to reach out to Black Americans and, and their places, uh, their institutions of influence. So, you know, visit churches because many Black Americans do uh, have a robust uh, religious aspect to their lives. Visit Black Americans in other spaces, at universities. Reinvigorate your Republican uh, student bodies and conservative political student bodies at universities and colleges. Speak to Black American needs in your platform specifically and do not couch it in minorities. Uh, and when I say speak to Black Americans, what we're also seeing is folks like me who are descendants of slaves. I'm a seventh generation American on one side of my family and fifth on the other that we can trace back with documentation um, with no known recent immigrant uh, ancestor. Speak to the, the needs of descendants of slaves and the needs of Black Americans who are descendants of slaves, multi-generational Americans, my folks who participated in the Civil War, participated in and had to experience Jim Crow and the Civil Rights era. Our needs are different than the needs of recent immigrants. And so the Republican Party needs to be able to delineate those populations and their specific needs and not aggregate them together. But first, we have to, or simultaneously, we have to reach across those party lines. And what I tell Black people is we have to invite Republicans in as well. There are ways in which we have essentially let Republicans know we're not interested because, you know, we went to the red all Republicans are racist, so why even bother having a conversation with them? So it's a two-way street, but Republicans have um, an obligation, I think, to recognize the ways in which uh, some of their actions turn off Black voters, and Black voters need to open the doors to listen to and influence and shape the minds and the policies of all. President Trump uh initiated the First Step program. I think he reached out in a variety of ways, uh, had young Republicans, uh, young Black Republicans at the White House. Uh, and as I have said to a number of people, I, I think that President Trump reached out to Black America more aggressively than any other Republican in my lifetime, I think. Um, and so I, I, how do you interpret that effort, and I don't want to make it about Trump as much as the reach out of a Republican leader to black America. Uh, do you think that was effective? Do you, would you encourage others in the Republican Party to follow uh, President Trump's example? Um, you know, where, and, and maybe we, I don't know if I should be making it as much about Republican versus Democrat or just how, uh, you know, how are the, as I kind of was saying before, how are the needs of black America in 2022 being met by political parties? Because whether you're black, Hispanic, or white, we're identifying or should be looking to, is a political party addressing the issues that impact us and our family? I mean, that's right, true of everyone. And, and perhaps that's the larger issue, that if you have uh, so many, 90% of black America just kind of voting on automatic pilot for the Democratic Party, you have little, you're giving little reason for the Democrats to go out of their way to be concerned about the black vote because they can take it for granted. Yeah, so I don't know that I characterize it as voting on automatic pilot. I understand what you are saying. I think there, again, is that history 
of the ways in which the needs of Black Americans are spoken to by some um, leaders and some parties and not others. So it is not a uh, polar thing where it's just Democrats and Republicans. Black American needs and Black Americans need to be involved across the spectrum with the Green Party, with Libertarians, in, in independents as well. And all of those parties need to speak to all the constituencies of the United States, and that includes Black, and includes Black Americans and those folks who want to be elected to represent us in our republic need to understand the populations that they are serving in very nuanced and specific ways, and they need to understand the specific needs of those populations. And particularly, I think they need to understand the barriers to access and opportunities that are unique to those specific populations. For example, I talked about descendants of slaves and the like. So yes, I, I champion and um, appreciate the reach across uh, that President Trump did, the reach out to Black America. And what's really unfortunate, and I think offensive really, is that folks uh, criticized people who chose to work with the leader of the free world. That's a very emotional reaction to me. Uh, there may have been and are legitimate concerns for past actions and people still, if you have, if you hold the executive office of the United States of America, all of us need to be willing to talk to you to nuance the policies that you provide, the things that you support and the ways in which you exert your executive power. Same for the legislature, regardless of your party and regardless of your history, we need to influence and hold people accountable. I would say yes, follow that lead and be more creative. Reach out to Black Americans the same way that to other not familiar need America and the barriers that are part of Black America for what currently exists, uh, resources and access that currently exist. Seek advisors uh, who really do understand a Black America and are pro-Black. If you're interested in serving immigrant groups, you would talk to folks who understand their needs. The majority of Black Americans are descendants of slaves. And what we do need to do is to talk to freedmen, talk to, to those descendants who are familiar with their own history and the specific needs of their environment. You know, you talk about the first step act, step act, if I may extend this for a moment, and I think that recognizes the ways in which past policies have been harmful to Black Americans because of our understanding of social dynamics and the root causes of social behavior. It is for every person, every legislature, every legislator, every executive to really be willing and able, and I think even eager to undo the negative impacts of policies that are happened that have happened in the past, even when those policies were ones that they previously supported. When you uh, when we talk about uh, let's say some specific issues, are there? So let's say it might be. Uh, gun rights, gun ownership, it might be abortion. Mm. Uh, when we go through the litany of issues that one can go through, are there certain issues that you would say, and we're generalizing because there's obviously black America that doesn't think with one mind, you have different, you know, differences right. within the black life. community. But uh, are there some issues that would tend to resonate more would you say with black americans and i mean would it be gun rights would it be the abortion issue would it be you know what would you say that uh, i mean i think some republicans would say as an example if you said or if 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 there was a you know large segment of the black uh, americans that said uh we want I'm making this up. We want gun regulations. You would have a lot of Republicans saying, "Well, we we're not going to go there." Uh, you mm -hmm. know, that's just a legitimate difference. But where where are the similarities? Where I think Republicans may have a positions that are appreciated by Black voters that the Republicans don't even realize that that those positions right. uh, are there, and they just need to market them better. Yeah, so Terry, that's the task, right? Is to find those synergies, to find the spaces in which there is synergy. I would say there is a significant portion of the Black American population who supports 2A, and they also want safe gun ownership. I think we all should want safe 
gun ownership so that people in our sphere of influence in our homes who shouldn't have access to weapons don't have them and people who uh, do not know how to handle a gun safely uh, are have safeguards in the home so that doesn't happen right so we have many unintentional shootings of young children for example and we have family members who have mental health concerns who really should not have access to weapons when they are in those episodes so what are the what are the points of uh, synergy are republicans against offering, for example, free gun locks or significantly reduced gun locks as a public safety measure within the community, that doesn't inhibit gun ownership, but it does prevent some of the unintended consequences of having unsecured guns in the home. So th there are nuances in the conversation that I think get lost sometimes when we talk about the issues at the sort of uh, airplane level, when we, when we get down to the ground level of how it's implemented and how it, how it is executed, we might find more synergy. I think many Black Americans um, support a woman's right to choose as it is often framed, but are also recognizing that many of abortion clinics are within Black communities, right? We also recognize the history of, of organizations like Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and the like and eugenicists. And even though they've divorced themselves or attempted to anyway, divorced themselves from that history, we also recognize still many of their institutions are in Black communities, uh, even though the majority of babies who are aborted are not Black, but a disproportionate number of babies who are aborted are Black. So we need to dig, I think, even deeper into the larger umbrella issues and get to the more granular level of how they are impacting individuals and how we plan to implement our uh, support of those policies or even our opposition to them. We, we said off the top your article was in Newsweek, which you're a contributor to. Uh, that came out in November. I'm just curious, what kind of feedback did you get from your article? Yeah, so the feedback from this article, that was my fourth one for 2021, uh, my fourth article for 2021 in Newsweek. And the feedback from this particular article has been robust. People are still talking about it. People are still sharing it. And what I'm finding is that many on the Republican side are saying it's about time, <laughs> right? Come on over. We would love to have a conversation about how to actually make this happen. Uh, there are folks on the Democratic side, particularly Black Americans, who are saying, where would we go? Why would we go to the Republican side when we know that they are racist, when we know that they are against Black people, when we know that they are attempting to marginalize uh, and prevent Black people's right to exercise their citizenship rights of voting? Uh, so again, what you are seeing is this sort of um, lack of conversation, lack of real relationship. And I think that's one of the calls to action is we have to get into relationship and dialogue with each other, not just for the purpose of, of, of talking, right? And hearing ourselves talk, but for the purpose of truly understanding and demystifying each other and our positions to develop real relationships, real dialogue, so that we don't adhere to dated narratives and so that other people people don't impose their interpretations of who we each are, what the Republicans are about, what Black voters do and don't want. And so that's what I'm encouraging, is that all stakeholders really start to reach across these invisible sort of force fields and get to know each other one-to-one -one, uh, in, in small spaces and also at, at the large institutional sort of level. We, you know, it used to be that the Black Caucus was entirely made up of Democratic uh, congressmen. Uh, we have now, though, over the last decade or so, uh, have a number of Republicans serving in the House of Re Black Republicans in the House of Representatives uh, and in the U.S. Senate. And it, it, again, this is where I think, you know, uh, 2022 is not 1962. It's not 1965. Uh, and I, I think that we have, we are a political reality that maybe is a happening on the ground and in communities across America 
where the language of uh, um, the at the at the national level the language of politics hasn't caught up to the reality that there is a, an emerging black middle class that the often the issues are in sync whether you're black or white you care about you don't you want safe neighborhoods and not violent neighborhoods you want your kids to be well educated uh, you want a an economy that is thriving and open to uh, upward progression so uh, there is there is all of that and I think we're you know making a dent in maybe and with your article raising awareness that the Republicans should be reaching out to black Americans more aggressively and at least finding out where they can work together. Uh, we say in your uh, ID that you are a uh, business consultant. Why don't you tell us a, a little bit of just about Pamela Long, uh, Pamela Denise Long, you go by Denise. Uh, who are you and, and to what extent when you, do you talk about these issues uh, maybe when you're doing your consulting work? Yeah, so um, I really cut my teeth in the consulting work around implementing trauma-informed care and implementing diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. The work that I do for Youth Centric Therapy Services really focuses on centering dialogue and relationships through the implementation of change through that process. So we provide trainings as well as ongoing embedded implementation support to implementation teams who are trying to implement change in their institutions regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism policy and practices, as well as trauma-informed care. So we marry the two uh, for the business consulting piece. In terms of my background, I uh, graduated from Mizzou uh, in the 90s uh, with a bachelor's in health science and practiced for the last 20 years uh, as a clinician, as an administrator in healthcare, and also in education. Um, my background is really also master's in higher ed in educational psychology, and you mentioned the doctorate that I am finishing up, and that is focused on organizational leadership and development. And my dissertation really does look at what is the what are the markers and the determinants for effective executive leadership in the implementation of diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, and really looking at the struggles that people go through within themselves, as well as interpersonally, as they're trying to lead this systems change work. So folks can reach out to me and learn more about that at www.youthcentrics.com. That's Y-O-U-T-H. C-E-N-T-R-I-X dot com. And I'll tell you for a minute, Terry, if I may, uh, why the name of the company is what it was. So I originally started this in 2014, um, recognizing the ways in which trauma, um, that's overwhelming adversity that affects the way people show up in their life's roles, um, how that happens a lot in, a, in childhood, and that we have to recognize the ways in which the things people have experienced from birth to 18 affects their mental health and their development overall. And when I get to the systems change piece of this work, I'm really asking the question in terms of youth centrics, what type of system are we bequeathing to the next generation of our youth? So diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, um, really trying to get us to be able to develop our own skills and capacities to have systems changing dialogue and relationships and develop the skills and capacity of our children to do the same for a better system that benefits us all. Denise Long, we're going to be going in 2022. Obviously, it's an election year and the political discussion will be heating up. What you and I have talked about right here, uh, I think, is going to be a growing part of it as the Republicans, uh, I believe, will continue to be reaching out and trying to make inroads within the black community and try to uh, get those votes. Because black America votes so solidly Democratic in, in real terms, any kind of a number shift could have a, a major impact on who wins an election if you go from 90% black vote in, a, in an election to where maybe it's only 80% black vote. Uh, it's not a major swing in ultimate terms, but it certainly is a major impact on whether it's a, a mayor's race, a congressional race, or, or what have you. We thank you for joining us, and I hope that we can, throughout the year, come back and talk to you again uh, on some of these issues and some of the issues that pop up periodically that uh, focus on what we've been talking about today. 
It'd be my pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Terry. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.